day for a travel Tuesday. I'm taking a step back and talking a little bit more about what is sustainable travel and tourism and is it even possible? And talking a little bit about uh, me as a consultant because I'm based here in Hiroshima, Japan and what I'm trying to do with my life, with my work, is to support local businesses and entrepreneurs and destination managers and guides and even travelers to try to help them find more balance in what quality of life and work for local people and quality of experience for visitors. So let me just talk a little bit about why I started my own business in 2019 called the Inbound Ambassador. So you can see it on inboundambassador.com. Uh, Inbound Ambassador basically is a consulting business, just me, it's my own solo venture, uh, trying to balance the needs of local people with visitors to have clear communication and focus on more sustainable, ethical and responsible products and services that keep an eye on the balance of people, planet and profits, communicating value of sustainability to a wider international audience. So in the inbound part of that uh, is the international visitor coming to Japan and the ambassador part of that is to try to balance the needs of local people with the needs of the international visitor. And I include in my work uh, trying to create a better balance for international residents of Japan as well, because we know that international residents are key to successful international travelers being welcome as well. And a lot of international residents are ambassadors themselves. They love Japan. They invite family and friends to Japan. They're often hosts to international travelers as well. So I'm trying to work with a lot of international residents like me who love traveling around Japan and really appreciate preserving the culture. Uh, let's talk about some of the basic ideas for sustainable travel, sustainable business. There are two sides I want to talk about, uh, the customer, the traveler side, and the host, the business owner or the manager or the destination policymaker side. Um, let's start with the traveler. All right, where are my travelers? Okay, so let's start with the travel pack. When you are traveling around Japan or when you're traveling anywhere in the world, do you take a set of things to help you travel more sustainably? So for example, my coffee cup, uh, in Japan, we often use my for, yeah, something that's yours, uh, your personal one. So my coffee cup, my water bottle, my utensils and straw, my fudoshiki and my container. So anybody who's not in Japan, uh, do you know what all of those are? <laughs> so I'll explain. So this is my little travel pack. This is what I take uh, before I go out on a trip. And it's a little bit bulky. Um, I love traveling places where I don't need this. But unfortunately, most of the places you travel in Japan, you do need this. So what do I have? I have my own water bottle. So I want to find places in Japan where I can refill my water. I use the app My Mizu, for example, to help me find places I can refill for free with clean drinking water. Japan's drinking water is very good. There is no need to buy plastic water bottles uh, while you're traveling. And my coffee cup. So, oh, I have a great coffee cup. Uh, this keeps it nice and warm. I love hot coffee. And uh, so take this to any coffee place and get it refilled. Sometimes they give you a little discount 
if you refill. I am not a fan of the most popular convenience store chain in Japan because they actually refuse to let you use your own coffee cup. Yeah, I won't mention, maybe I should mention, they're the most popular convenience store here. But some convenience store chains like Lawson or Family Mart, they will let you use your own coffee cup at their coffee machines and they will give you a discount. So definitely choose Lawson or Family Mart. And I won't, choose, I won't even mention the other one. <laughs> uh, take your own utensils. So I was doing a collaborative project uh, it hasn't de been developed yet, but don't you find that a lot of the travel utensil packs are so small, but I like the ones that are longer because I want to have chopsticks, which are adult size, not children's size. And a lot, a lot of the travel uh, utensils packs that you can buy, which are so cute, they don't fit adult size chopsticks. So I want to have at least one pair of chopsticks. Usually I have two or three pairs of chopsticks because I'm a mom and I'm usually eating out with my family. So I, my kids don't want to carry it. So I will carry the extra chopsticks so that we don't have to use wadibashi, the throwaway single use uh, chopsticks, which is often not from Japanese wood anymore. It's often imported and sometimes even from rainforest wood. So it's much better, uh, even if some companies say they're using local wood, which is great. It's better if you have your own reusable and you don't have to throw away any single use chopsticks, right? So I like this uh, container because it fits the adult size. And I have my own straw because in Japan, quite often, uh, there's still the plastic straw. Now, when you order any cold drink, you have to be really fast and say, no plastic straw, please. And even sometimes if you ask, it still comes with a plastic straw, which is a shame. Um, but yeah, usually you can get it without a straw. No straw, no lid is what I usually say if I don't have my own cup, right? No straw, no lid, and you can save on that little bit of extra plastic. I also have a glass straw. Uh, I like the glass straw. I don't know. It depends on your, your style. Some people like the metal. Some people don't like the metal. Some people like the straw. Um, I also have a fork or a spoon. Some things are just easier to eat with fork or spoon, especially if you injure your wrist, which I, I just found out this month. It's very difficult if you injure your right hand or your dominant hand to use chopsticks. That was a revelation for me this month. So I had to learn how to use chopsticks with my left hand and I had to change my clothes quite often because I was not good at it. <laughs> All right, another thing I do carry in this little bag uh, because I was visiting the Zero Waste town of Kamikatsu, so I had a chance to use Zero Waste shops um, where you can use your own container to refill uh, for things. And I have this cute little uh, Japanese character, Ultraman fighter, metal uh, little bento box. And I can put foods in, small foods or snacks or nuts or things that are sold at a zero waste shop. And then uh, if I have a big meal as well and I can't eat it all at the time, I can put my leftovers in here and have my own little doggy bag, which I like that idea. Um, if you're traveling in Japan, it's also really useful to have a tenugui, which is a long, thin piece of material like this. Isn't that a cute one with a cat? I got this from Onomichi. And you can use this after you are in the bathroom and you wash your hands. You can dry your hands with this. Uh, if you're doing something hard, like athletic, and uh, you need it, your hair off your face, you can tie it around your head. <laughs> um, somebody recommended the other day, if you have an injury, 
which I did while I was hiking. I injured my wrist. Uh, you can use furoshiki or tenugui as a sling, a makeshift sling. Very good idea. Um, I love furoshiki. So this is tenugui. Furoshiki is a longer square piece of material that you can use to wrap your groceries. You can use it uh, to wrap products in instead of getting a plastic bag. Uh, you can sit on it if you go to the park and you're, you need a mat to sit on so you don't get your, your clothes messy. I noticed a lot of um, beautifully dressed Japanese women, so in their beautiful kimono or their beautiful uh, nice clothes, they put fudoshiki or tenigui, the material on the bench before they sit on a public bench to make sure they don't get any stains on their clothes. And that's another good idea. Um, you know, Lush, so the international uh, beauty products brand Lush, which has very sustainable products made in the country they're sold. Um, but they're also embracing the idea of fudoshiki. So Lush does not sell any products in plastic bags anymore. You have to pay for a paper bag, but you can also buy a fudoshiki, a reusable um, cloth wrapping which they call the wrap, the knot wrap, I think. Um, but they're using it internationally. And this is a Japanese concept. So let's bring it back to Japan and use fudoshiki for everything, right? <laughs> um, if you, as a traveler, if you can't, uh, for some reason, you don't have your set of things, uh, you don't have it with you for whatever reason, uh, look for things which are compostable or biodegradable instead of plastic. So recently I went to a vegan pop-up. We're really happy to see Omnibus Hiroshima. A little shout out to them. And they're using these coffee cups, which are entirely compostable or biodegradable. Now, if you were doing compost next to the shop, perfect. You could put it out in the soil and dig it in and it'll become dirt again. Um, but like most things in Japan, uh, most of the garbage is burnt. So if this is burnt, it has a lot less damage than if something plastic is burnt in terms of the, the whole circular economy of how the material is sourced. So this comes from paper, from trees, from nature not chemicals like plastic, and it, after it's burnt or put back in the ground, it goes back to nature. So choosing these kinds of materials when you're traveling is also a really good idea. All right, uh, next, uh, let's talk about, we're talking about travelers first, right? For travelers, ah, good morning. Hi, Jidong. Nice to see you. Uh, traveler rules. Okay, so my basic traveler rules, which I would advise any traveler, and I try to live by this myself, uh, be a conservationist while on holiday. So sometimes I hear from travelers, and, and it's tempting as a traveler yourself as well, uh, while you're on holiday, if it's a hot place, just leave the air conditioner on because you're paying, so why not, right? Or uh, you take super long showers or super big baths, right? Use lots of water. Or you eat meat all the time. Maybe at home, you eat meat maybe once a week or once every few days, but on holiday, you're eating meat at every meal. So this is, it's good to think about uh, being a conservationist in your normal life, in your normal work, but also as a traveler on holiday, right? Um, also, uh, ask for more sustainable options. So is plastic-free available, um, single-use? In If it's single-use or can I use my own or is it local? So always asking for the more sustainable options, asking for and looking for more sustainable options, right? Oh, I lost it. Where did traveler's rules go? <laughs> Sorry, 
I have lost it. Traveler's rules. Okay, come back. Here we go. Here we go. Let me make it bigger. Okay. Um, so ask for more sustainable options, like I just said. Uh, make the best choices with what is available. Um, so if you need to eat something and there's nothing um, that's local or a vegan or whatever is your choice, but you have to eat something, eat something, you know, don't starve yourself. Try to make the best choice with what is available and be idealistic, be the best you can be when it's available or prepare something in advance, bring your own snacks. If you think there's a chance you're not going to find what you need, uh, just be prepared. Uh, also, if there's something you don't, you really want and it's not available, maybe the next shop has it. Maybe you can go to the convenience store nearby. Maybe you can go to the supermarket nearby, right? So it takes more planning to be sustainable, but it's not impossible for sure. Also, when buying products uh, as a traveler, uh, ask yourself the same questions you should when you're in your own country. Uh, do you love it? Do you or your friends and family really want it? Uh, does it support local? So if in Japan, try to look for made in Japan products. Um, and if in other countries, look for products made in that area, and then you're supporting local people, supporting the local economy better. Uh, communicate direct to the, the vendor or via Google or TripAdvisor for reviews. So thinking about how beneficial your review can be as a traveler. Uh, this is part of consumer activism. So as you are a customer making better choices, you are creating demand for more sustainable products and services. You are doing soft pressure and soft power push to make more sustainable products and services available, right? So part of making the right choices is writing the right reviews. So on Google or TripAdvisor or Booking.com or whatever you're using when you write your reviews, try to keep it positive and something which is actionable. So try to uh, give criticism which is proactive so the company can use this information and be better. Not just, I hate it, it was awful, but if there was this available, I would be really happy. Or I wish there was this available, that, like this other business, that would be wonderful, right? So try to make it constructive and positive, and hopefully your information you're communicating to the business or destination is being read and acted upon, right? Yeah, wonderful. Very important, that communication aspect of travel. And I think a lot of us, we might be doing social media, but we might not um, do the reviews on Google. We might not do the reviews from the agent that we're using for the booking, but all of that is so important in creating positive change. Um, for example, reusable. So any uh, destination, any business should be trying to show the visitor that they are reusing old buildings, they are reusing traditions and culture and materials. That is a very clear example of being sustainable. So when I see the old retro style drink machines where you can drink from a glass bottle and then you put it in the container and then it, it's washed and refilled and reused, this is a clear indication to me that the host, the owner, the manager, the, the person running this business is thinking about sustainability and they're saving money because 
they have less waste to deal with as well. So it's a win-win-win, right? Another example here uh, at a bakery in U2 in Onomichi. So you can buy the drinks in glass bottles, not plastic. They do have plastic as well, but you can choose drinks in glass bottles, which is not always available. You can choose to have your uh, baked goods in a basket, reusable basket. Do you see anything that is thrown away and has to be burnt here? No, everything can be reused or recycled. Now let's talk about glass for a minute. Glass and then the top is metal. So glass and metal has value in the recycle chain in Japan and all over the world. Plastic does not. Plastic has to be burnt in Japan. It is very rarely reused, but glass and metal is reutilized as a valuable material. So always try to choose reusable or glass or metal for drinks and containers if possible. All right, another example. So this is in Setoda. Uh, the serviette, yes, Blinky Bill, great, great idea. Okay, I'm gonna go back to this picture because Blinky Bill is an expert at sustainability and he has just added the serviette. Okay, so it's not shown here in the picture, but I always look for the oshibori in Japan, the towel that is given to customers when they sit down to eat something, or even if you're taking something <laughs> to a table and eating it. They usually give it to you. Now, recent in old times, in old Japan, the perfect sustainable idea is the reusable, nice, cool towel or a warmed towel if it's a cool time of year, right? Like autumn or winter. But recently, they have a lot of disposable towels, like wet tissue inside plastic. So something the host can do, something the customer can do is to appreciate the reusable towel type without the plastic and ask for that reusable towel type and say, no, thank you, if it's a disposable single use plastic type. Uh, quite often there is somewhere to go and wash your hands uh, if it is the disposable type, but you do need to wash your hands. Yeah, take care of your health. Definitely. <laughs> awesome, Blinky Bill. Thanks for that. All right. Next uh, in the reusable category, it's wonderful if a business or destination can show how it is reusing heritage, tradition, culture, preserving that, but also reusing uh, good materials which have more use and in their life. They don't have to be destroyed and thrown away. So for example, this is in Setoda. Uh, when I did the talk about sustainable travel in Setoda Island, which is not far from Onomichi in Hiroshima in this video. And this is a beautiful old uh, traditional house, which they remodeled and restored certain parts that they could so the beams, for example, these beautiful wooden beams, still reusable, still have value, still give this beautiful aesthetic design for the visitor. And so they're reusing what they can, which is of high quality, and changing what needed to be changed. So you can retain this beautiful aesthetic, this high quality experience for the customer and keep this traditional, beautiful, irreplaceable aspect of a traditional Japanese house, right? So you have this beautiful win-win situation. So that's also under the reusable category. Now, another thing that I look for, um, and I think a lot of uh, travelers are also looking for is the idea of connection and uh, local value. So as a visitor, as a host, um, are you able to access art galleries, 
museums, uh, learn about the history, go to local markets, uh, buy local products from local small businesses or entrepreneurs, not only the big businesses, not only the chains, right? So in the bottom right, uh, when I talked about Yamaguchi with a local um, international resident, Alison Miyake, uh, she took us around the local market in Hikari in Yamaguchi and showed us a lot of the local goods for sale and talk to local vendors. So this connection, this authentic connection that the visitor can have with the local people in the community, and there is a benefit for the local people and benefit for the visitor, this is very important for sustainability, right? That's one of the aims. Uh, next, uh, talking about access to art and museums. So here we were talking about uh, unusual travel destinations you, worth seeking out in Hiroshima with Kim Bardoel, who's an excellent photographer. And she often travels places with her daughter. So is it family friendly? Is it accessible in English? Um, is it or other languages is there enough information where this beautiful art or this beautiful culture or tradition can be understood by the outsiders and this goes back to that balance of local needs and visitor needs right because if a visitor can come to a destination and be able to appreciate the local cu culture more and the local traditions and the local artists and the local, you know, people more, that's a win-win, right? Because then the local people appreciate that the visitor appreciates and the visitor appreciates that they are able to understand what is available, right? So it's just a win-win-wins all over the place, but it takes planning and it usually takes hiring experts who can help you communicate that information or translate that information or provide good content in different languages or an app, right? So you have to hire people who can help you make that connection across the bridge. That's my, my little gesture here for bridge. Um, another example here, uh, family fun that I gave from Fukuyama uh, when I went with my kids is they uh, had a lot of old retro style like game areas. And um, so having that added uh, old style that you don't normally see retro culture in a fun way, which is fun for kids to access, fun for families to access, and easy to understand, easy to appreciate was another added appeal aspect. All right. Oh, can't go back. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of things to think about um, for a host and for a visitor. Um, but one of the basic strategies, so as a sustainability strategist or a sustainability consultant, uh, these are some of the ideas and advice that I give to hosts. And of course, um, it's case by case. <laughs> you can't say this is going to apply to absolutely every destination, every business, right? That's why you need consultants like me to listen to your situation and give you personalized advice and information that you can make the most effective strategy. So for the host, uh, the five basic rules, uh, make targets for what is more sustainable and uh, choose the best possible options from what is available. Reassess how you're doing. So after you make the targets, you chose some good options. Now you're going to reassess how it's going along the way and then make some new targets. And then also remember 
this is a long-term strategy, so don't give up. <laughs> That's very important advice, right? And I think um, if a business or something is thinking, ah, oh, yeah, we're just going to think of a sustainability strategy just, just this month or just during a one month campaign or one year, even one year campaign, it doesn't work, right? Or if you have one person in the business who is assigned to do the sustainability strategy, it's very unlikely to work. You need everybody involved. You need to have a long-term view. You need to make it a part of your DNA. It has to become a part of what you do 24-7. Also, as a host, uh, try not to be defensive. This is really difficult, right? Because if you have a great business, product or service or destination, you are very proud of it. And you don't like it when people say anything even slightly negative or critical because you feel like you're doing your best and you're going for it, right? But try really hard not to be defensive. Take comments thoughtfully. Be mindful of a long-term view of your sustainable journey. And muri shinaide, don't burn out. So don't try to do too much at once. Uh, think of it as long term. Don't burn out and don't give up. Akirame naide ne. Don't give up. So this is all uh, really important advice for hosts. Now, host idea ideally uh, makes sustainability, like I said before, a part of the mission, the DNA, the branding for homework and travel twenty four seven. So it's something that I, I sometimes say to destinations or guides or small businesses is everybody in your business should be thinking about sustainability at home and at work. And that's always a big shock, right? But if you don't, if you think of it as just a work thing, it's not going to work as well, right? If you think of it as uh, only something you think about nine to five while you're at work, you're not going to start to see it everywhere. You're not going to start to see progress. You're not going to start to see possibilities and better options as well. So it's definitely something you have to keep talking about, keep thinking about, keep reassessing, looking for other good ideas around, uh, getting advice from consultants who can help you, <laughs> talking with your customers, talking with the local community, and just make it a part of what you're always thinking about for a while. And after a while, when you're always thinking about it, you can't unsee it. You will see it everywhere. You will notice it in other businesses. You will notice it in, in yourself. So it's just something you have to take on completely, like all in. You can't do it a little bit. So that's my advice for the host. Um, so host sustainable, host basics. Here's some more ideas which I think are pretty applicable to most places around Japan. Um, and although I say case by case, of course, your every area is going to have specific uh, hurdles, which make it a little bit more difficult or easy case by case. But these are some basics for uh, destinations in Japan and very common struggles for places in Japan. So plant-based options. This is big. In Japan, there are so few options for people who do not eat meat or fish. That's just a basic struggle, no matter where you go. And if you are a plant-based traveler, you really have to plan ahead. You really have to do research and do your homework. And you usually have to ask if certain dishes are possible without meat or without fish. So what I always recommend to destinations, and wouldn't be it be a dream in Japan, is 
every destination, every restaurant, every business has at least one plant-based option. Is that too much to ask? I don't know. I don't think so. But what a selling point for any visitor to Japan to know that there's always going to be one. And the reason I say that is because you might think, but there's only like 10% at the most of visitors to Japan who are vegan vegetarian, right? But if you include the flexitarian, the sustainable traveler, maybe that sustainable focused traveler, which we know is about 70% at the latest data, um, they might eat meat or fish, but they don't want to eat it every meal of every day, right? So we started calling them flexitarians. They're flexible, but if there is a plant-based option that they like, they'll choose it, right? And I know a lot of uh, businesses argue, well, Japanese customers only love meat and fish. They don't care about uh, plant-based options. I'm not sure that's true. But if you only offer it once a week or once a year, you're not going to find out. So if you put a plant-based option on your menu and you like it, you're proud of it, maybe it features beautiful local vegetables, um, people will start ordering it. Yeah, try it. <laughs> Ooh, a new word. Awesome. Thanks, Blinky Bill. Uh, so reusable options as well. Uh, make sure your coffee shop doesn't only have single-use disposable coffee cups. If people are getting their coffee for eat in or in the cafe, give them a reusable coffee cup, right? So have reusable options at your business, have reusable options at your destination. Refillable water sources. Now, some people are like, why don't you just fill up in Japan in parks? Yes, I love that, but it's not easy to find, right? So I made a goal for myself. I do not ever buy pet bottles, plastic bottles, plastic drink bottles. I just won't buy them. Now, it's a big problem in Japan because if I go in a convenience store, 99.9% .9 of all the drinks are in only plastic bottles. Unless I drink alcohol, <laughs> all the alcohol is in cans or a very sugary canned coffee, which I'm trying to be vegan. So usually it has milk in or too much sugar. So I can't drink that. Um, I do drink the lemon drinks, like the Genki drinks, the energy drinks, <laughs> because they're in glass and metal. Um, but I, I made a target for myself, no pet bottles. And it's hard but if I plan ahead and bring my own refillable water bottle, it is possible if I use an app like MyMizu to help me find places to fill up. It's not as easy as you think. Try it. Try to make a target for yourself. Challenge yourself. No more pet bottles. And then you try to refill a water bottle in parks or around Japan. It's not as easy as you might think. <laughs> Um, so refillable water sources at your restaurant. Do you have a jug of water that customers can refill their water with? Um, if you have a destination, do you have parks that have refillable water fountains? Um, check because a lot of parks now don't have water fountains anymore. So definitely check. Uh, composting and biodegradable options, I think is really important for destinations and businesses. I saw a great uh, zero waste shop in Onomichi the other day called the Organic Store, which I put on my Twitter. And she has a little composting box in front of her shop. So even small shops can show how they're trying to be sustainable by composting their organic waste. Um, so if you have food scraps or something from your lunch, you can dig it in the dirt, it becomes dirt again. You have cuttings from the vegetables, uh, as you're making food, you're not going to eat that dirty end of the root of the vegetable. You put it in your compost. Sometimes you get compost treasures too. Like um, I've had tomatoes grow up from the compost and you have like a treasure. Oh, 
tomato is coming and you didn't expect it, right? Fantastic. Um, so if you don't have compost, uh, have biodegradable because most trash in Japan is burnt. So if it's biodegradable, it comes from plants. So it would go back to nature, but it also burns with less damaging effects. Uh, support local sustainable products services and entrepreneurs. So I love to see places like Onomichi or Satoda, which are supporting local businesses, supporting local people who are running interesting, high quality, culturally rich businesses. I love to see a government or taxpayer money go to support these local businesses, which locals value, right? We don't want every destination to have only convenience store national chains and Don Quixote national chains or uh, national chain restaurants, right? We want unique local run by locals businesses which have authenticity for the area and local charm. That's a win-win for the local destination and the visitor. Oh my gosh. I have so many hints, right? Too much? <laughs> hey, Blinky Bill's got a great comment. Or monster pumpkin vines. Yeah. If you compost some pumpkin seeds, you're going to get some monster pumpkin vines. Hopefully in time for Halloween. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> I just had some compost treasure come up and I didn't know what it is. Apparently it's goji berry. So. I tried eating one. It didn't taste good. I'm going to try drying them because goji berry is very good for your health. Um, but yeah, check what it is. Make sure it's not poison before you eat it. <laughs> um, support local sustainable product services and entrepreneurs. Preserve traditions, culture, and heritage wherever possible. Yes. Keep locals happy with subsidies added value. Yes. So if you have a lot of businesses which are shuttering and closing up, Maybe you can offer free space to some local student groups who are artists and they can do art galleries for free. You know, students don't have money. So if you offer them free access to show their work and to bring other people in, you're also creating destination appeal and more value for locals. Nobody likes to walk through a shopping area and everything's closed up like a ghost town, right? You got to find ways to support people to be there and to be offering a lively atmosphere. It's good for locals, good for visitors. Also, preserve trees, forests, and nature. Yes. How many times do you look at the mountains and you, you only see the quick growth sugi and it's so sad, right? So if possible, Find some local entrepreneurs who want to use that local wood, um, which was planted years ago, and there's too much of the, the same one kind. Try to find uh, local businesses who can use it for houses or remodeling or making beautiful products and uh, create more income generation for the local economy, make more appeal for local products for visitors. But then when you cut down those trees, you can reutilize that forest, create a more diverse forest, uh, bring back some of the rice paddies. In Kamikatsu, I walked through some of these quick growth sugi cedar forests, and they were planted on top of beautiful terrace rice paddies. So wouldn't it be lovely to have the rice paddies open again, right? So it's case by case, area by area. Everybody has different hurdles and successes to think about. Um, but definitely think about preserving your local trees, forests, and nature. It makes such a difference for local quality of life as well for visitors' quality of experience. Uh, make sure you're managing crowds. Uh, one of the things I talk about uh, in this sustainable travel series is over tourism. So, of course, we have to talk about uh, when people visit beautiful Kamakura or when people visit beautiful Kyoto. 
Of course, everybody wants to go to the same beautiful, famous places. I was at Miyajima yesterday. Miyajima also has more visitors than Disneyland, right? So if we have too many people coming at the same time to the same destination, we're going to have a problem for local people and for the visitor experience. So we have to think of some sustainable strategies to try to balance the number of visitors who can access at the same time. One of the more extreme pieces of advice I gave uh, to areas like Kyoto for the classic area is don't allow the uh, tour buses to come in. Don't allow any non-local traffic to come in. Only local buses or local cars, people who live there are allowed to use it. London did that, very successful. Um, another thing is to uh, stagger entry for temples and places which are very popular. For example, Big Buddha here in the picture in Q uh, Kamakura. Um, you want to make sure there's not too many people accessing it at the same time. Another idea in Kamakura, which I gave in this video, is uh, outside Kamakura train station, there is one most popular shopping street with lots of um, shops and eateries, which is really cute, but it's the, sh it's the street everybody goes on. So it's way too crowded. So if you just have some uh, local students or staff who are hired to be at that entry point of that street, and when it's too busy, you can just see it's chock-a-block full of people, you divert people to the next street over, which actually is just as interesting, has loads of great classic shops and eateries on it. So you're not decreasing the value of experience, but you're helping to spread the visitors out. So I have so many ideas like that. If you need help for your destination, please get in touch. <laughs> Over tourism is a big challenge uh, for many places around the world, right? All right, let's go back to the list so I can stay on track. <laughs> Manage crowds. Uh, you can add fees. You can add bookings uh, in advance. You can add other ways, like I said, to uh, spread the visitors out across an area and stagger crowds. Uh, as a destination or a business, please think about clean energy. Can you invest in solar or wind energy or use local wood for biomass as the hotel in Kamikatsu is doing? Um, can you offer EV charging to encourage visitors who drive to your destination to use clean vehicles like plug-in hybrids or electric cars, right? So this helps the quality of air. You're helping local people be healthier. Uh, you're also helping keep the local soil and water cleaner because you have less pollution, right? There's so many win-win-wins about clean energy. Uh, one thing Japan is doing too much of for energy is coal, and they still have a plan to use coal past 2030. This is not a good plan. We need to stop using coal as soon as possible. It's the most damaging of the fossil fuels. Uh, let's think about renewable energy and clean energy for businesses or destinations. Making choices on the local level can have a big positive effect for the national problem. Uh, that was a big issue pre-COVID. Yes, it's a big issue always, managing crowds, right? Good job, Bill. Thank you. Uh, waste management is another big one. So I was so happy to have a consulting job to Kamikatsu, the zero waste town, uh, twice this year. Thank you so much, Heartland Japan. It's great working with you guys. Um, so waste management is huge. And what Kamikatsu town found is if they did mandatory composting for all residents and businesses, immediately they reduced their waste uh, problems and the cost of managing the waste by 30%. So it's awesome, right? If you just make everybody compost, it's better for the local environment. It builds up the local soil and you're reducing costs by having that 
burden of having to deal with all of that garbage. Uh, you also should be looking for ways to reuse and reduce and recycle. So getting rid of all the single use plastic and changing for paper and wood and metal and glass. Yes, let's do that instead and having reusable uh, systems. I was so happy to see uh, when I visited Onomichi recently in the Onomichi Brewery and they have their reusable bottles and you can bring in your own container and fill up at the brewery. Um, and then I saw a lot of the Coke, um, old style Coke machines where you drink at the machine and then you leave the bottle and it's washed and reused, refilled. That's what we need. It has a cool retro vibe and a lot less waste, which reduces cost too. You save money. Who doesn't like that? Uh, clean resources as well. So make sure you think about what your most valuable local assets are. Usually clean water, clean rivers, clean ocean, clean forests, clean dirt. How do you maintain that? How do you keep it as clean as possible, which increases the quality of life for locals and the quality of experience? for visitors. All right. Have I done it? Have I gone through most of it? Okay. Local guides. Uh, this is another uh, advice that I think connects to what I was saying before. Um, having information to make the local traditions, the local culture accessible to visitors. One of the assets of a good travel destination is having good local guides. So for example, I went to Hiroshima's beautiful Shukain Gardens. I saw a lot of the trees had this straw wrapping and I hadn't seen it before. Well, no, I often see it and I think it's just decoration, but I saw a local guide there. And so I asked him, what is the meaning of the wrapping? Is it like a religious meaning or does it have a practical meaning? And he explained to me that this straw wrapping is only around the maki tree, which is a Japanese pine tree. And they often get infested by a certain kind of bug. And if in autumn, they put this straw around the tree, and then it catches that insect's eggs. And then in spring, they take off all this straw and they make a big bonfire and they burn it. And it stops infestation of the tree and protects the trees. And I never would have learned that if it wasn't for that local guide being there in the garden. So having local guides that you are paying who are local experts to give that added value to the visitor, that's priceless. I'm gonna be telling that story for the rest of my life to everybody I meet or anybody I see with this straw wrapping, right? <laughs> so priceless, right? Investing in local experts, investing in local people is priceless. Yeah, I think I've gone through uh, most of my ideas and rules and uh, the idea that it's a long-term view of sustainability, long-term view of success. You have to embed it into everything you do in your work time, in your off time. Uh, here's an example of retaining some cool retro uh, old school machines. I love that. This is from Onomichi, Nicole. So some people might say it's old, it's dirty, let's just get rid of it. But make sure you get some feedback from visitors. What do they think about that? Maybe they don't mind it. Maybe they think it's cool. And if you don't like it, you don't like the view of it, you could keep it at the back for a little while or in storage. And then when the trend comes around again and these things become cool again, uh, bring it back out, right? But once you get rid of it, these antique things are things you can't um, make again, new. They lose their value if you try to make a new version, right? 
And then uh, another example. So this is a new uh, entrepreneur. She's doing a chocolate uh, business and everything is all vegan. So she's found uh, demand even for Japanese customers. Uh, she's doing Hiroshima Omnibus. She's doing a pop-up shop every now and again in Hiroshima. Beautiful, high-quality, handmade chocolates. And uh, she's finding appeal with the local customer as well as the international trend of offering more plant-based options. We also know plant-based is more sustainable because the dairy industry, the meat industry has such a heavy carbon impact on our climate crisis, right? And I talked about nature, preserving nature, culture, beautiful areas. If you can preserve it and it is valuable to local people, it will be valuable for the user experience, for the visitor as well. So try to preserve at all costs and think of that long-term view of success and sustainability. Better environmentally than the sticky plastic or chemicals. Yes, definitely. So environmental considerations, but also considering how valuable it is to the quality of life of local people and that it will have um, more value to the quality of the visit for the visitor. So anyway, that is my hour. I can't believe I talked for a full hour about this. I was thinking in my mind, I just give a little bit of advice, be like 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> One hour. Wow. I can talk, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining everyone. Uh, before I finish, I just want to mention this month I am providing a special uh, promotion. So if you sign up as a monthly sponsor of yours truly, JJ Walsh, Inbound Ambassador this month on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee or YouTube, that I am very happy to share my support for your support by sending you a postcard. So sign up as a monthly sponsor by the end of this month, end of November. Really appreciate you guys. Um, my business, I'm a solopreneur, uh, very little travel related business this year. So I've been putting all my enthusiasm and energy into this online free content for all of you. Um, but for sponsors, there is some added bonus content and benefit there on Patreon, buy me a coffee and uh, YouTube. So if you follow the links, I will put the links below or you can see the links on my profile please do uh, think about supporting if you can, much appreciated. And a shout out to my sponsors on HAPS here, Louise Poppy, an amazing travel guide in New Zealand. Thank you so much. And Dave in Osaka, also a great live streamer here on HAPS and YouTube. And uh, Jay and Mary on uh, Buy Me A Coffee. Thank you so much. And Michelle Devent. Uh, here on HAPS. Thank you so much. And on YouTube, Chris and Marion and Ayaka, you guys are wonderful monthly sponsors. Thank you so much. And Patreon, uh, I have Donna. Donna has been a monthly sponsor for a long time. So I don't have many monthly sponsors and I do appreciate you guys so much. So if you feel like you would like to support the work that I do, much appreciated. And thank you guys so much for joining today. It's awesome to talk about travel. Definitely something I'm very passionate about, uh, making travel a more sustainable option to balance the needs of locals and the needs of the visitor so that we can continue to travel and connect with people across borders, which has so much added benefit, of course, for world peace international communications, and so many important aspects of why we appreciate being human, right? Travel is so important. Thank you so much for joining, Blinky. I enjoyed seeing all of your wonderful comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Jidon Payne, nice to see you here, and so many others who have joined today. Thank you so much. 
everyone have a great day. I hope you go out and do some travel, even in your local community on Travel Tuesday. Go and explore. Take care. See you next time.